are live. I may ask you guys to retweet it or um, if you want to do an Instagram story, it's up to you. Yeah. Um, it's setting up right now. Let me see. It says Done. it's now live on YouTube. Redirecting to YouTube. Hello, people. Okay. All right, we are live. You. All right. Is this the first time you've had two people on at once? Like three different locations all in the same window here? I think so. Yeah? I think Ooh. so. Send us an email and we will <laughs> or answer here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, so. do, you, do you want me to help moderate or anything, Billy? I can just be like the moderator. How about you and Jason take it over and I'll just kind of like hang <laughs> you out. You could. The, for reals. Uh, like, I love doing stuff like that. All right. Oh, gonna, here we are. Here we are on YouTube. Yeah, I sent you guys the link. Ooh, I should probably turn down and off the, <laughs> the volume. Yeah. That would be good. <laughs> that would be good. Okay. Let me share this out. Um, how do we get the link? I gotta uh, figure out how to do this ahead of time. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me get the link here. Sorry, people who are in here as we get settled in. Uh, how do I copy this? That's what I'm looking at too. It's right. Okay. What's up, Jacob? Live. Hello from Cincinnati. With? Hi, William. Thanks for S Skyline Chili. On. Skyline Chili. Yeah, in since Cincy. Is that in, in Cincinnati? Yeah. I love chili. Is that a place that I need to go to? You know, it is. Uh, I finally uh -huh. tried it when I went to Cincinnati. It is a staple but yeah. I, I don't necessarily say I would recommend it. <laughs> it is a been there, done, it is a been there, <laughs> done that. And uh, that was good enough for that. Okay. <laughs> Hello, All right. Aaron Davis. All right, everyone. Lisa, Alex. And... CK. Okay. So I'm going to have to do some behind the scenes stuff here. Uh, welcome to the Billy Yang Podcast. We're going to go live for the... We may do this on occasion. We'll see how tonight goes. Tonight will be a nice little guinea pig <laughs> test run to see if this is something I want to manage in the future. But we're going to do this. Um, you know, I know it's kind of turbulent right now with a bunch of shitty news and shitty people out there. Uh, that's something we can't really avoid, you know, um, but I do firmly believe that it is the overwhelming minority of people that the overwhelming majority of people are good and you know, um, and good people out there are going to do good things. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. We're going to talk about you, your goals, and we're going to introduce my guests today, Jason Coop and Sally McRae. How are you guys? We're good. You're good, Sally. Wonder right? <laughs> we are. We chatted before. We're on the same wavelength. <laughs> All right. For the most part. <laughs> so... <laughs> Like I said, it's the first episode of 2020 and to help kick off the new year, I thought it would be both fun and informative to have two people I admire very much in Jason and Sally. Um, I, let me take a quick second to introduce them if you don't know who they are. Jason Coop is a coach for CTS, Carmichael Training System, and uh, where he specializes in working with ultra endurance athletes, right Coop? That is correct. All right, he's a published author of Training Essentials for Ultra Running, How to Train Smarter, Race Faster, and Maximize Your Ultra Marathon Performance. That is an ultra marathon in of itself, that title. I'm, I was about um, to say, I'm glad you got that whole title in because I couldn't have done Yeah, I had to read off it. I, that was like, yeah. yeah. He also writes occasionally for trainright.com. He is a phenomenal athlete in his own right mm -hmm. with finishes at races like the grueling Tour de Jeans in Italy. Look that up if you don't know what that is, kids. Hard Rock 100, Western States, Badwater, Leadville, list goes on and on. How are you, Coop? I'm good. Everything's good here in Colorado. We're in the middle of the country. Nothing's bothering us. We're away from all the earthquakes and riots and <laughs> I have no complaints. All right. And uh, that laugh that you hear is my good friend, Sally McCray. She's also a coach. She's an elite athlete for Nike Trail 
Um, she's a mom, she's a wife, she's a speaker. She wears a lot of hats. Um, soon to be author too, right? Sally, can I tease that? Is that okay? No, don't tease it yet. Or <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> also start getting all the messages that you get when you start to tease a film. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. When is the book coming out, Sally? When is the book coming out? Yeah, let's hope, let's, let's hope Sally's timeline is like markedly faster than Billy's timeline. For putting <laughs> How dare you, man? <laughs> How uh -oh. dare you? The show has officially started, people. <laughs> it's about getting it right. It's about getting it right. I explained on my last broadcast why, so I'm not going to get into all that. But um, to finish up with Sally, like Coop, she likes her races long and hard. Races like Javelina 100, Western States, UTMB, Badwater, Tarawar 100, Ultra Trail, Australia, Ultra Trail, Cape Town. I think you see a theme here. She loves racing internationally. Um, and how can we forget, Sally, the PCT 50 back in June of, no, May of 2010, May where, we, of 2010. where you and I first met, and we've been <laughs> insufferable and insufferable ever since. How are you, Sally? Oh my gosh, I'm doing great, Billy, and this is, I'm so excited for this podcast, but like I had said earlier, and both Jason and I have already Instagrammed it out. I'm slightly terrified to do a podcast with both of you. I spent time with you guys. We've been in groups together and it's quite entertaining. And well, I think uh, the last time the three of us were together was at the Deuce in Northern California, right? It was Back yeah, to... there or was it Austin? Weren't we all in Austin Ooh, together yeah, too? You're right. You're right. Was yeah, it, but, was, what, but the Deuce what was funner. After? Yeah. The Deuce was funner. <laughs> There was a lot it was of because uh, Austin, we had some really good meat. I mean, Jason took us to like a really good barbecue. Oh my gosh, there's such yeah, good. Speaking food of there. long and hard, <laughs> <laughs> this is already going. On I know, rails. <laughs> and it's me initiating. <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> I'm gonna have to lower my standards of professionalism. <laughs> for this podcast. Look, so um, I'm drinking Indy, coffee it, tonight. <laughs> I'm changing the subject. <laughs> Let's do a let's do a quick uh, state of 2021 before we get into your questions. And I do want that to be the focus. I want to uh, I want the majority of the show to be focused on helping you guys answering your questions about heading into 2021, setting up good intentions, good practices. With um, you know, with all, there's still a lot of uncertainty out there, right? Whether races will happen, will they not happen? But I think it's important to at least get the mindset right, uh, regardless of what happens. Much like today. It's all about having that ultra running mindset, right? To be able to pivot, to problem solve and uh, make sure attitude first and foremost is just uh, set correctly. So um, that is going to be the theme of today. Um, I think Coop, let's start with you. Just heading into 2021, like what are you, what are you, how are you, I guess, framing your athletes mindsets into heading into the new year, whether or not races happen, like, tell me about what you're telling your athletes right now. Well, first off, people are ready to go. I mean, people have this <clears throat> huge reservoir of like pent up energy that they're just that they're just chomping at the bit to release at whatever comes first. And the way the whole racing process has worked throughout 2020, all the races kind of rolled over to 2021. And it's starting to look you know, that landscape is starting to look rather favorable where the race directors are figuring out ways to run safe, productive races, maybe mm -hmm. cutting down the field size, having protocols uh, in place and things like that. And the athletes are starting to get really excited about it. But despite all of that, I'm, I still go back to the very fundamentals, which I think got exposed tremendously in 2020. And that's that athletes have to have a really strong purpose and a really strong why behind yeah. what they're doing. And we, we saw very clearly, or at least I saw as a coach very clearly, two really divergent types of athletes emerge out of 2020. We saw the ones that, are, that went race to race and buckle to buckle and were chasing bright, shiny objects for the entirety of their running career. And that's fine. That's an absolutely fine way to, to set it up. I'm not knocking that. But absent of those bright, shiny things, they were left kind of floundering in the middle of the ocean trying to find shore. And the, you contrast that with the athletes who had a strong purpose and a strong why 
for the for the most part they really didn't skip a beat yeah it was harder for them they might have like had some like failing motivation and things like that but they didn't fall off the the the, the face of the earth so i'm actually using the beginning of 2021 to can like continue to reinforce that aspect that people need to have strong why strong purposes behind what they're doing because that will always transcend whatever bright shiny object you are chasing whether it's a belt buckle or a PR or losing 10 pounds or anything like that, which is all really, really pertinent because we're at the you know very beginning of New Year's resolutions where everybody's starting to fall off the wagon already. <laughs> that, that's what I'm doing with my athletes is just having them kind of like recenter themselves or confirm the center that they have already established for their own personal running and well-being. And, and Jason, I love, I love what you just said right there, <clears throat> having your athletes recenter yourselves. What are some of the things that you help them do? I mean, obviously you're, you're coaching all different personalities. People are motivated by different things. Do you find that there's kind of like a, a, like a handful of things that just work as far as helping athletes re recenter? Cause I think that's so important. It doesn't even feel like it's a, a new year, right? So sometimes, you know, the beginning of this year, people need something to, for direction. So I'd love to hear what, what it is that you, that you offer in, in that area. Yeah, I actually, I mean, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take claim to this strategy. It's a, it's, it's a guy by the name of Simon Sinek, who I'm sure a lot of the uh, listeners will be familiar with, but he, he wrote this really great book. Start, it's called start with why, and it's primarily a business book. And it's aimed at getting businesses and business leaders kind of refocused on what, what their purpose is. And what I do with my athletes is I, that are, that, that don't have like a strong connection to running itself or kind of floundering around mm -hmm. is I have them go through the things that they do on a regular basis that are voluntary. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we try to find the common threads between those things and tie them all together with the purpose. And I'll just take you through a really quick example of, of okay. what, what I did. So the things that I do on a routine basis that are completely voluntary, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to force me to do it is I volunteer a tremendous amount of, of my time to the man to incline. I'm on their, I'm on their board. I was a founding member of their board. It's a 5013C here in Colorado Springs and their volunteer coordinator and faithfully every single month and sometimes more than that i'm volunteering and donating my time for this organization to keep up this iconic trail uh here in colorado springs that's, that's awesome. the first thing <clears throat> second thing is i coach obviously right and mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. all of my coaching income evaporated tomorrow i would probably still coach and i started out as a volunteer coach uh, wow. to to kind of prove that very fact and the third thing is is I, I mentor other coaches. I spend a lot of time taking our particular new coaches through the initial paces of what it takes to become a successful, a, su a successful coach. And the thing that, that intertwines all three of those is I'm making something better after interacting with it. I'm leaving it better than when it started. Right. Mm -hmm. And when, and that transcends to things to myself. So when I personally go and work out, when I, you know, go do a workout or go do a run or go do a race, I feel like I'm a better human. I'm a better husband. I'm a better, you know, coach, all of those things. I am better than when I started out before that activity. So that's the common theme of, 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 of what ties together all of those activities that I do is I just like to leave things better than when I found them. Mm, I love that. That is really good. And I, I took notes. I wrote down the title of that book. I feel like I've heard of that book before or seen it. It's a really good book. It's, it, it's a really good book. It's a really good audio book too. I know a lot of, of uh, runners use audio books when yeah. they're running around, but mm -hmm. the, you can take some of the, I think, although it's intended as a business book, you can take some of the kind of, kind of some of the strategy or the philosophy and you can apply it to a lot of a lot of areas of life. And he's go go check out his TED Talk. Maybe if I get a second, I'll link it in the chat room right now. But it's a it, oh, he's cool. a, he's a really pro powerful speaker, and you can kind of pick up on all those concepts easy. I love it. Hey Coop, somebody said your mic isn't loud enough. So really eat that mic, swallow that mic. I'll <laughs> gain a little bit too. Oh While you do that, Sally, how would you answer that question? <laughs> 
<laughs> which one? <laughs> How no. are you talking to your athletes? Um, what, do you want me to answer the questions that people ask me in the chat room? No, no, no. Um, just oh. generally from the top, like, how are you talking to your athletes right now to get their mindset right? Well, it's it. I, I feel like my the way that I've been communicating with them hasn't really pivoted too much because I feel like, you know, the difference from today and where we were four weeks ago, not a lot has changed. And so the biggest things that I've really been focusing on, and it's, I guess it is a little bit similar to how Jason, um, to really what Jason was, was first talking about too, is, is understanding that running in the running aspect of our life, the way that that plays a role in our life, it truly is so much more than just the racing. And so, um, you know, I've done some Zooms with, with my roster and written emails and things like that. And I've really just encouraged everyone just to take some time and find the things that you're grateful for that running has brought you that has nothing to do with racing in the intensity of your training, um, your, your pace, any PRs. Realize that the, the running um, is filled with ability and freedom, you know, to have that freedom to move your body in such a way um, to, you know, to be able to get outside and run, or even, you know, if, if it still is on a treadmill, um, you know, I, I think all of us have known people or know people right now that don't have that ability. They don't have that choice. And so I think when, when things start to fall apart, it's so important that we just focus on um, gratitude. I know that sometimes is even now more, I feel like it's, it, it's almost watered down when we say, stay, stay grateful, stay thankful. That isn't always easy to do. Um, when you're in the grind and you're in the day in and day out, it isn't always easy to be grateful for even the things that we have. But it's, I, I really just encourage, take it one day at a time. Don't focus so much on whether or not your race is gonna happen. Focus on showing up today and putting in the work because you never know where that work is going to take you. Um, I have I have one athlete. She's highly successful in everything that she does, like everything in her life, both professionally. Um, just and she's such a joy to talk to. I love talking to her. And um, we got in on this conversation. She's very motivated. She wants to race. She keeps on trying to find races and they keep on getting shut down. And, and, you know, I, I finally said to her, I was like, you know what? I, all that I want you to do is when you wake up in the morning to train, I want you to take a minute to congratulate yourself for showing up. You know, so often we, we kind of gauge and, and give ourselves credit for how hard we worked or how fast we went or, how sweaty we are after a workout. And I said, I don't want you to think about any of that because those that show up, um, it adds up, it, that's the detail, you know, that's, that's what makes it uh, and cars out character in somebody. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the gist of, of what I've been telling my, my roster is, you know, it's the one day at a time, it's finding that gratitude and um, being appreciative just for the gift um, that we have to do this sport. Hey, hey, Sally, can I ask you a question about your coaching? Uh-oh. Do do, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, curious, I'm really I'm super curious about it. Because we haven't talked about this a whole, a whole lot. Do you do a lot uh -huh. of like group communication, like you communicating to your entire coaching group, a message or a something? Yeah, I do like, I'll do group emails, um, kind of like a roster <clears throat> check-in. Um, and then sometimes I'll do zooms. There was a while, like with my roster, I was doing a zoom once a week with everyone mm -hmm. because it was just, I noticed there was a trend with all the messages I was getting where everyone was feeling really, um, just kind of, uh, low, yeah, <laughs> I should that's say. What I was yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Was there, like, yeah. did you find that there, that was somehow like galvanizing across your group? The fact that there was this like one to many or these, these different interconnective points between everybody, even though they don't train or run together. Absolutely. It was, um, it was, it was like in the dead of summer. I think it was, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you remember when, when I think people were hopeful of summer. They're hopeful yeah. of summer in the beginning of fall. And then it was just like canceled, canceled, canceled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's, that's actually why I started doing that. It's like get together. Um, yeah. Not everyone loves zoom though. You know, like I, I noticed too, like you get everyone on your roster on there and you're like, wow, all of you are introverts, like <laughs> in an extreme way. So a lot of times I felt like I had to be, you know, entertaining and keeping the conversation going, which was totally fine. But um, there's something about seeing faces and just connecting with them. I, I think that's definitely something. And I know I'm, Jason, you are so present um, at your athletes races and just around the world. I feel like you're at every race I'm at, no matter what country I'm in, <laughs> you're very present. And so I, I'm, I'm sure you can understand this idea of really missing the, um, the tone and the emotion of your athletes and not being able to um, be in the presence of that. It makes coaching a little bit harder. Well, oh, he had the I, sprinter van all ready to go for <laughs> to follow his athletes around the country, and he's gonna have to wait another year. I, no, I I'm not waiting another year. I'm waiting another like two or three weeks. I just set my calendar like literally two or three days ago. I set the whole thing from you know the end of January all the way through December, and I am psyched. Like I am like totally psyched to get out there and get out on the road, and mainly to Sally's point start to have those those connections with people that personally I sorely missed. I mean, that's why you see me at all these races because yeah. it's something that I enjoy so mm -hmm. so so very much. So mm -hmm. yeah, I can't wait. I've got a really, really cool calendar coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All yeah. right, guys. <clears throat> Let's get right to it. I want to make this as interactive as possible. So we're gonna have, I think we'll do like uh, you know, like one person hop on and actually join our, our live stream. And then maybe we'll answer some questions. We'll definitely answer the questions in the chat as well. So keep them coming. These guys are, uh, you know, their brains, you definitely <laughs> want to pick them. So here we go. Well, Billy, uh, we'll well, just let me, let me pause yeah. you for one second because there's not a lot of questions at the uh -huh. moment. They're uh -huh. all just commenting on your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want like to take a, a second to address the shirt, Sally? <laughs> No, no, I just know that it's just amazing. It's an incredible shirt. Yes, courtesy of one Miss Sally McRae. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Billy Boy. Yeah, thank you again. <laughs> it's Brad. I'm actually going to wear this at races. If, I, if and when races come back, that is the intention. Um, let's kick off our first caller. Uh, Soon Chol has a big race coming up and is wondering mm. about sleep strategy. I think Coop, this will be mainly for you. Sally, if you want to chime in, you're more than welcome to. Coop, but take it away. We're going to have Soon Chol join us. Soon Chol, awesome. whenever you're ready, make sure you turn your audio on when you are let into the room. Oh, this is so cool. <laughs> you there, buddy? There he hey, is. <clears throat> What's going on, man? Uh, not much, just getting uh, some work in and listening to the conversation about the cats. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's we're pretty awesome, for. right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your question for Coop? Oh, All right. Or Sally? Um, this question is for Coop. Uh, thank you, by the way. A couple years ago, you answered my question on what the go-to workout is, and you recommended that 45-minute tempo run. So I've been sticking to that ever since. But uh, my that question was on our show. What's that? That was on the show, right? It was uh, two years ago, right before UTMF. I think uh, yeah. Corey Waltering was doing that for uh, for you as well, Jason. Right? Yep. Yep. All right. So my question tonight is: uh, I'm doing the Coca Dona 250. Oh, in May, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Air Viper for uh, keeping the races going. Shout out to Mio yeah. and crew. Um, so my question is for Jason around sleep strategies for 200 plus milers. So specifically, do you wait until you're like just really sleepy to take a nap? Or do you plan on sleeping at a certain mileage or time during the race? And is there an ideal frequency, meaning do you try to sleep just three times for 30 minutes or once during the day for a couple hours? 
Okay, wait, can, before you answer that, Jason, can we just pause and appreciate this question for a second? Everyone <laughs> yeah. in the chat room <laughs> who is new to ultra marathons, <laughs> like we are now at the 200 plus races asking oh about sleep God. strategy. We have come a long way, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. I, I feel that we're coming in hot and heavy. I need to like reset a little bit and, re and like get all of my intellectual resources in order. <laughs> So, okay. So uh, this is a incredibly hotly debated question amongst 200 mile participants. And if you go around and you take a straw poll with people, anybody who's ever done a 200 miler, you will hear wildly different answers <laughs> to this. And the, and the reason for that is, is it's not an area that we know very much about. Um, the U S military has done a tremendous amount of research on on soldiers in sleep deprived states. And so what we know and a lot of the patterns and things like that, that we can use in ultra marathon actually comes from that. It's just because they can torture their soldiers. It's very hard to get uh, research subjects to do these things just because they're arduous and nobody wants to sign up to stay up for 48 hours. So, that, so that's the caveat that a lot of this is just, it's a lot of educated guessing. The first thing that you can absolutely bank on and I'm using that term intentionally, is to bank some sleep in advance of the race. And this is something that has been tried and tried and true. They've studied this ad nauseum and you'll hear different, you'll hear, hear different ways of describing this uh, in terms of the vocabulary, whether or not you can actually bank sleep or you're just erasing a sleep deficit or whatever. But the concept is the same. The week before the race, stay in bed longer. And what I've done with my athletes and what I've done for myself before these big long things is just to stay in bed for 10 hours the week before the race. And I know that's that's impractical in some situations, right? You gotta get up and go to work and things like that. But the point is, is the week before the race, try to get in as much sleep as possible to erase any sleep deficit you have. And then in addition to, in addition to that, try to bank some, some sleep on top of that. It's very well studied across a multitude of different sports. Then you get to your practical question of once the race starts, when do you actually sleep? I have found the most success and I've seen the most success with athletes who wait until the end of the second night to start to sleep. So they go through the entire first night, go through the entire second day, and then get as far into the second night as possible to sleep. And the general strategy you want to deploy is to try to time whenever you're going to wake up and I'll get how long this, how long the sleep period will be in a second, but you want to time whenever you're going to wake up as close to sunrise as possible. And this is an old expedition length adventure racing trick that we've that we've learned kind of throughout the years. And when I worked when I used to work with a lot of these athletes, there was actually this quite it was quite a transformational moment where back in the old eco challenge days, if everybody can remember that now that has been revived once everybody's kind of like rehashing all, what this actually happened. The teams used to push and push and push and push and push two days, three days without sleep. And it was literally a last team standing type of proposition as to who actually won. But the teams that actually figured out how to get sleep earlier in the race, and they would fall behind all of their competitors earlier in the race, actually ended up making up almost all that time or they ended up winning later on in the race. And it's a slightly different scenario in adventure racing because you have this high cognitive demand of having to navigate. And we know that sleep deprivation impacts your cognitive abilities much more so than it does your physiological properties. So if you want to think about navigating, it's going to impact you. Well, we actually know this. We know this from, from the military. It impacts their shooting uh, percentage by about 9 or 10%. But it impacts your physiology by about 3 or 6%. So you're still getting impacted through this sleep deprivation. You want to try to avoid it as much as possible. So that's, that's the, that's the second thing is when you're actually in the race, you're trying to time your awake period such that it's as close to the sunrise as possible. Now you get into this scenario of, okay, do you take a lot of little naps 
or do you take one big sleep? And that is honestly the big mystery question. And I, 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 I can't answer that universally for every single athlete out there because I don't think that there is, I don't think that there is a really good one. Um, I do think that the longer duration that you're out there, if you think that you're going to be out there for, let's just say six days, as opposed to four days or something like that, you, you're going to require a little bit longer chunks of sleep as opposed to a three day race or a three and a half day race or something like the tour de Giants where the winners can get away with like nodding off on their poles and literally so waking crazy. up when their head hits the ground, right? <laughs> so you can't really, if you're a 96 hour <laughs> finisher like me, you're going to have to take a couple of like really serious, like two to three hour, uh, two to three hour sleeps. So that piece of it, I think you're going to have to like work through some logistics in terms of how to figure it out. But if you take these other two pieces, you set, you set yourself up for success and that's to bank some sleep before the race, make sure you're timing your awake time as close to sunrise as possible. And I don't think it matters where you sleep, whether you're sleeping on the side of the trail or you curl up in, you know, a car. I don't know what the race rules are, whether you can actually get in a car or something like that. But I honestly don't think it matters. Usually you're just so tired at the time that, you know, a rock ends up being a pretty good pillow. So <laughs> good, good, good luck, man. It is, it is one of the unsolved mysteries of these longer races of actually when to sleep. Now that we're seeing these long, like FKTs, you're seeing it come, you're seeing these strategies kind of come to light even more. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't have a good universal answer for every, for everybody across the entire spectrum of it. Yeah. I do the same thing for even my piddly little hundred mile races, the week leading up to it, bank to sleep, stay in bed. And, um, you know, hopefully it'll pay off race weekend, or I guess for you, it might extend through Tuesday or something. I don't know how long these 250 well, even, mile races take. Think about it though. Even if you're like a 40 or 44 or 47 hour finisher in hard rock, right? Cut off for hard rocks, 48 hours. Those there, you're still going through periods of sleep deprivation. And so by banking sleep, what you're doing is, is you're taking this amount of physiological deterioration that you know is going to happen because you're staying awake for so long. And let's just call that 8%, right? If you bank that sleep beforehand, that 8% deficit then becomes a 4% deficit. And that's actually pretty meaningful at the end of the day, you can run the math on that. And like that might save somebody, you know, 60 or 90 minutes or something like that. And you talk about a 46 hour finisher, that's a really meaningful improvement that you, that you can get with a very, very simple intervention. Got it. Very cool. cool. Soon, Joel, where are you located? I'm in San Francisco. Oh, okay. I love the picture behind you. Oh, that's uh, Tuscany. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> beautiful. All right, Soon, Joel. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you for the question and uh, best of luck at the, uh, what was it called again? The Coco? Coco, Coco Dona. Coco Dona, okay. Yeah, that's so luck. rad. Yeah, so I'm so tempted to do it. <laughs> do it, Sally. Mags is doing it. Oh, yeah. Yep. I told her I'd join her, that I'd ride on her back. <laughs> she could drag me. <laughs> Mags as in Maggie? <laughs> yeah. Good girl? Yep. Maggie, if you're in here, chime in, by the way. Um, <laughs> Billy, Mag there's th someone in the chat room. Yeah. Their, their handle is Young Yoda. I just saw that. that <laughs> Young so Yoda, cool. do you see what is on Billy's <laughs> Billy's desk? He loves Yoda. Sally, Maybe did you Yoda. see? Uh, did you happen to see a question that you want to address now, or should we go to our next next caller? Um, a few people brought up some strength and gym stuff. Okay. Um, so I'll just I'll answer that really quick, and then yeah, let's go to. The, I love the the callers coming in. I think it's really cool. So um, so I. Uh, the question is how many days a week um, are you going to the gym? And then right after I answered that, I said four to five days a week or most days of the week I'm in the gym. And then um, they asked, how, how do you log volume? Are you counting reps or doing a certain exercise for um, a time interval? So um, <clears throat> really quickly on that, my gym sessions, it's, it's not like I'm going to the gym and doing like a CrossFit style workout every single time. Um, every day there's something specific I'm working on but originally the reason why I started going like every day was um because it was like the first workout of the day so I'd go like at 4 a.m and I kind of came up with this thing called you know check in with your body and that's where I would really assess how my body had recovered from the previous day's workout and so 
Um, if I had any tightness, tightness, a lack of mobility, or if anything was like nagging, I'd take care of it right then and there in the gym. So sometimes, you know, the first 30 minutes of my gym session is literally just sitting on a mat and doing the most boring mundane exercises to make sure that my body is ready for the workout later in the day. So it takes four to five days for me to really get everything in as far as injury prevention, um, maybe a core specific day. And then where also I am doing heavy weights or high repetition. So each day is different. So um, I really customize it to myself. I don't follow like a specific plan. I owned a fitness business for a long time. I am a, a trainer. I coach a lot of people in strength. Um, but I'm a big believer in getting to the gym as a way to keep your body strong for for a long race, especially ultra marathoners, and for the longevity of your, your running life. So um, I'll use like just my, my watch has, I use a Coros watch and there's like a gym cardio and like a strength thing on there. So I'll just hit start and it links up with, um, with Strava. So I hit save when I'm done. And so I can just see that in there when I'm going through my logs for the week. I'm like, all right, I spent an hour and 45 minutes in the gym on this day. And I'll just take notes. Like first 30 minutes I was stretching, I was doing core. Um, and then on other days where it's weight specific, or if I'm doing weight cardio intervals that are usually specific to a race. So like when I train for UTMB, I'll do like 20 pound weight vests on the stair mill, you know, and I do repeats from the stair mill to the treadmill um, on and off with like a weight vest or something like that. So it really just comes down to what race I'm training for is as how I train. So with COVID the whole, the whole year was just about keeping my body strong and injury free. And of course I wanted to keep it exciting. So I had a lot of fun creating new workouts and just trying different things. Um, so yeah, I personally love the gym. So I could probably talk about that for like the entire session, but I'm not going to move on to the next caller. <laughs> Our gyms are shut down, Sally. All I have are my resistance bands. <laughs> well, in that we vein, <laughs> in that vein, I think we will admit Dustin. Dustin had a strength training related question, right? Hi, Dustin. Ooh, Dustin is an artist. He's got a guitar. He's got like a rock climbing thing in the background. He's got, oh, oh yeah. he's got a rock. Hi, Dustin. You're super interesting. You, your audio, I don't know if it's on yet, but we're totally like evaluating you right now. Yeah, we're figuring you out. <laughs> Dustin, can you hear us? Is that a Leadville hat he's wearing? I'm trying to see what his, for a second, I almost tried to like zoom in on the screen. Okay, I can't do that. I don't know, but Dustin is. He's still connecting to audio. Dustin, can you hear us? I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, let me get some of this stuff off my screen. Through the technology. I couldn't hear you. Yeah, Dustin, we were um, we were judging you based on everything in your room. So, <laughs> so Billy got <laughs> down to your, that you're a rock climber. I said you're an artist. I see a, a guitar and a painting no. in the back. Come no. on. <laughs> a, a roommate painted that for me, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you a rock climber? Um, I do pull-ups with that. Nice. I, I like with to rock fingers? climb. Like just huh? with your fingers, like a cat. Sally, yeah. Sally, focus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, we brought Dustin in for a reason. About the cat. That's, that's, that's the problem. Back, circle back to the cats. <laughs> so Dustin, the reason I let you in and uh, kind of bumped you to the front of the line is because you had a strength training related question, right? And we were on that topic. Correct, uh, Sally. You answered a lot of it. I did notice I've had to do more strength training lately. I feel for injury prevention as I get older. I see yeah. a lot of, uh, especially you, Sally, uh, Jeff Browning, mm -hmm. the list goes on about people who have either never strength trained and then have to transition because of an injury. Um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of glute strengthening uh, exercises because I've had an IT uh, injury and I can definitely like plus one for strength training. I think you should definitely work it into your regular repertoire. I think, and, and that was my question, I think, on the email. Uh, Sally, you answered most of that, where it fits into your schedule and how you feel. Mm -hmm. It was a two-part question. First of all, thanks, Sally, for all your inspiration. And Coop, Aww. your book is brilliant. Uh, it finally nailed it for me as far as joining uh, the intangibles and the feel bat ace aspect, along with a lot of science and uh, what I call nerd talk, which I love. Yes, <laughs> love it. Coop is definitely <laughs> a nerd, yeah. Nerds are the best. The uh, about uh, there's a small section somewhere in there about cross training and how strength training 
it seemed to downplay it. I don't know what you're, if you've been asked this question before, I know it's not great to make you a better runner specifically. Have you changed in your viewpoint of this? Is there something I missed? Yeah. I, so I, I do get that question a lot. And that is the way that I designed that section is probably my biggest regret from the first edition of the book. Mm. Can I tell like a two minute story? Yes, please. I'm going to tell yeah. two minute story anyway. I'm yeah. Gonna, gonna <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, so when I was writing the book, I basically had a word cap because the publisher who I'm incredibly grateful for, I'd, I'd never dreamed of publish a book and much less an ultra marathon training book. Um, they said, listen, the book's getting too big. And I had this huge section on strength training and cross training, and it got reduced to that 500 word sidebar is the long and the short of it. So I'm happy to say that in the new edition of the book, which will probably come out in like two or three months, if I get my act together, there's a whole chapter on strength training that I worked with one of our coaches with, and it goes through the whole thing, what exercises to choose, how to periodize it throughout the year and things like that. But to answer your question, and this is Sally and I are going to differ on this and that's totally fine. <laughs> um, I still, I still think that the performance proposition for strength training or cross training has to be weighed against the other things that you can do. And we know, we, we know throughout copious, copious amounts of research, strength training and endurance training have been studied ad nauseum. You can go and find thousands of papers on this, that when you incorporate a strength training program, you get about a two to 4% improvement in either running economy or, and or performance. You can weigh that two or 4% improvement in performance if it's worth it against a lot of different other types of interventions that are contraindicated with strength training. The one that I always bring up is rest. Strength training is not rest. Mm -hmm. And you can get, in a lot of cases, the same amount or a greater amount of performance improvement just by inducing more rest. So my take on strength training is not, it's, it's not one that I universally apply to athletes. Like a lot of coaches will do like, here's your, here's your training program. And it de facto includes strength training. I look at it as another tool that I can use with athletes and based on the athlete's individual situation, yes, no, maybe, are we going to actually include it? So that was the gist of that one section, right? What about the, I think the title of it was what about strength training or cross training? And it kind of comes down to the same answer. So I have the exact same answer in the new book. It's just elaborated on instead of 500 words, it's like 15,000 words. So. <laughs> So you can take the nickel version. There it is. You don't have to buy the new book I already gave you. That. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. It, it seemed like it's, you likened it to pick up basketball or yoga. And I totally understand what you're saying now. Well, you can go on and on and on and on because there's a gazillion modalities. I mean, Sally knows this for being in the fitness industry as long as she has. Like, there's always a new mo modality, right? Oh. There's freaking like Taibo and kickboxing. Right? <laughs> yes. and, you know, I mean, you name it. Like, there, and every one that comes along is the next greatest thing oh. for runners. Yep. It's like diets. And you know what, Jason, I, I do agree with, with much of what you said, if not all, I, all of it, I don't disagree with anything that you said. I, um, and yes, the fitness industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So there's always gonna be a new diet, a new fad, a new workout routine. I mean, it's amazing how many times they've regurgitated, oh God. um, the most basic exercises in muscle and fitness and shape magazine and all these health and fitness. You're like, this is the same stuff that you've been saying for decades, but yet we still, buy into it or we still act like we don't understand it. And it really, it, it is quite simple. Um, I, I worked at a sports physical therapist for a while and um, I did several different things. I wasn't <clears throat> treating people, but I learned a lot in my, in my time um, that I was there. And so strength training, it really came about and really hit home for me because what I found was that um, every time and this, this, this clinic treated a lot of athletes. We even had like a couple um, uh, Olympians too. And what I found is every time they treated an athlete, they would give them 14 to 20 exercises that they wanted them to then do. But the thing was, is that they also continued to make them come back to the clinic. And, you know, during my time there, I was like, this is ridic ridiculous. These core athletes are coming and paying so much money 
just to do the most basic exercises. And had they done these before, just on the regular, they wouldn't even be here in the first place. The majority of injuries are either because of a lack of mobility or a lack of strength. And so if we can incorporate exercises into our weekly training session that allows us to do the sport that, that we love to do, then we, we're, we are going to lessen the chance of injury and lessen that time that we spend um, inside a PT clinic. So, yeah. but when it does come down to the, the programming of strength training, and I think Jason, I, I know that you've studied and you, you could probably speak to this way better than I do, because when I was getting all my coaching certifications, I do remember that, that the guys that were teaching us, I, I felt like everyone had a different opinion right. and a lot of it had to do with who they were coaching. So right. track runners, sprinters, well, their strength training looked totally different for power and explosiveness and speed that they were doing for 10 to 30 seconds. Uh, and then, you know, you have the people that are coaching um, athletes for the marathon and then the 5K. And so, you know, they all kind of would speak to, well, then I would have them work on this. And then other coaches would, that would just say no strength training at all. They can do some pushups and squats and lunges, but we don't pick up weights. That's not what we do. So I have found over the years because ultra marathoning and Jason's book, your book is incredible. I have your book too. There's so much good stuff in there, but I'll tell you, when I started the sport, there was like nothing out there. Oh, fuck there me. wasn't, I mean, the stuff that you found online was ridiculous. And that so, was my blog, Sally. <laughs> you didn't get a lot of info from my blog, LARunner.com, shout out. You're, you were one of the first running blogs I read. I do remember that before I even met you. <laughs> and I did not learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, the, but what we are finding is that, you know, if, if an athlete is going to train to go and run, for 10, 15, 20, 30, and now, you know, we're looking at like these 250 mile races for days on end. It simply isn't coming down to just, hey, you need to run. Is your body, does it have the, the base, the strong base and the roots to withstand standing upright and moving forward for that many hours? Can you do that? And so what we find is that many times an athlete will feel strong the first 20, 30, 40 miles of a hundred mile race. And then suddenly at mile 70, they're like, whoa, my lower back is falling apart. My IT bands or my knees or my ankles, I've never felt this ever in my life. And so something that might be so tiny, a small, a small weakness or a small lack of mobility, it is now on a greater scale. It's magnified times a hundred because you've been pushing it just even <clears throat> in that single race. And so Really the, the, strength and the strength philosophy that I've had is train your body to endure. You don't need to train it to look like a CrossFit or you don't need to be thrown around tires or anything like that. But can you endure the hours out on a trail um, without falling apart? Well, so let me rephrase that. Is it a corrective exercises approach? Which, or that, that would be the vocabulary that a physical therapist's office would use. You're doing yeah. corrective exercises as opposed to strength exercises. Right. And you know what those exercises are. It's like that you're doing bridges and clams right. and you have the TheraBand and, yeah. um, you know, and I've, I've, asked, I've often told athletes, because I'll, I'll talk with athletes and say, listen, you don't have to have any equipment. Do you have a TheraBand? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a TheraBand? Can you do body weight? So. Yeah. Um, I just yeah, use different I, vocabulary for that because I like <laughs> to separate strength training, which is training mm -hmm. for strength yes. versus, mm -hmm. I, I don't even like the word corrective exercises. I've just never found a better one. And that yeah, seems it kind of sounds the, geriatric too. Well, it's not just to make anyone no, that excited no, about I, it. I the, the reason that I, the reason that I don't like it is that <laughs> you're assuming that something needs to be corrected. And hey, I, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt you guys. I don't want to inter interrupt no, you guys, but do. we have a, we have a lot of questions to get to. We can get to the, into the weeds with a lot of these questions, um, especially with you two guys and all Jason, your knowledge. Jason, bring me on your podcast. Cause I love talking about While this, Sally yeah. hoards herself out to other podcasts while she is on one. Um, <laughs> if you want to follow uh, Sally, uh, Sally's Instagram at yellow runner. Uh, she does a lot of these. Uh, <laughs> she demonstrates a lot of these strength exercises, single leg exercises, and at least I'm famous. I don't know. I feel like at least you're every single day. I feel like you're in the gym in some way, shape or form. So mm -hmm. definitely check her out. Uh, there is a question in the chat that I wanted to get to uh, love to runway. 
when is it helpful for average runners to get a coach? That was uh, part one. And then part two is advice to go from 10 minute pace to 8.30 pace for a marathon. She has six months, she or he has six months to train. Do go we ahead, do we need to like paper, rock, scissors for this? <laughs> no, go ahead. Go, get after it. I well, just I mean, it's a totally my... biased question that <laughs> yesterday, right? Is yeah. it good time for... So, no. Okay. So I've been, I've been coaching for a really long time, 20 years, and I give the same spiel to any new athlete that I'll give to kind of this question. A coach can always make a difference. Always. hundred percent. I can always get you to a better place. Sally can always get you to a better place than you can on your own accord. It doesn't matter whether you're just starting or you have 10 years of experience or 20 years of experience or whatever, having a high quality set of eyes guiding you doing what you're doing is unequivocally, as long as that coach knows what they're doing, unequivocally going to get you to a better place. How much of a better place is an open question that we can spend another three or four hours on. But I will say that the more experienced you are, the bigger proportional difference that a coach can make. And that's because when you're just starting out, I feel nervous now that Sally's taking a, 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 <laughs> a picture of us. I'm sorry, I just totally just lost kidding. my phone just just there. It's like, you know, the it's like the little laser that the cat sees. I get distracted that easily. Squirrel! <laughs> Everything's so, going back to the cat. Uh, I love exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> I try to tie it back. But it's because when you're just starting out, you'll improve as long as you don't screw it up. And I tell this to our younger coaches all the time when they get a new athlete that is relatively new to the sport and they come back and like, Hey, look at this athlete's, you know, threshold pace or look at their blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, you should be doing that because anything you do, as long as you don't screw them up is going to help them improve. Now I know that's not like a resounding, you know, like a resounding endorsement for coaching, but when you're first starting out, as long as you get some general guidance, it's really not that difference between like, getting some general guidance and somebody who has as much experience as Sally or I, after you get three, four, five years of experience, and we see this a lot with athletes, the improvements that you come by start to become asymptotic, which is my favorite like sciencey word to use because it makes me sound way smarter than I actually am. Can we say that word again? Asymptotic, <laughs> right? And all it okay. means is it starts to <laughs> flatten off, but I like to use the word asymptotic because like I said, it makes me sound smarter. But because those, improve, because those improvements start to flatten off, the architecture of your training and having somebody to play multiple roles within your running life, the role of the motivator and the psychologist and the support system and getting your you know, tactics and gear and nutrition and things like, like that, those start to become more important things in terms of squeaking out those extra improvements. So I will say that as you become more experienced, a coach can make a difference between you not improving and you continuing to see improvements. And that's where I think it, it, that's where I think really good coaches shine is after several years of improvement. Hey, you two really quickly, um, while we're on this topic, do either one of you have any room in your roster spot? Go ahead, Sally. <laughs> I, I, uh, not really. Okay. I have a few athletes I'm, <laughs> I'm interviewing right now. I got kind of a. All a right. Little... I just, yeah, I just want to make sure you guys are getting something for you, your you time. You can too. contact me, okay. <laughs> but I'm not advertising. Um, I'm not advertising it, but I, I do have a handful that I'm interviewing this week. So they can bid for a spot, right? The highest bidder. <laughs> Man, that is a tough sell, Sally. Like, so you're going to have somebody coming in that, you know. So... I like, I keep, well, I keep my, I like to keep my roster small. I'll just say that. That's it's smart. I'm, I'm not looking yeah. for. No, that's, that's, that's a way of a good coach. Coop, uh, I'm sorry. Coop, what about you before we move on to Sally? So I'll, I'll, I'm going to answer this in the plural. We, so the coaching group that I work for, we are always taking new athletes. Okay. Actually, we just hired two new coaches. We're training them right awesome. now. They're going to be, they're going to be available for athletes in a couple of weeks. Our, even our entry level coaches are absolutely, I use the word entry level because I've never found a better way to describe them. They're absolutely fantastic. I'll put them up against any coach out in, out in the business. So the answer is yes. And okay. we've got a variety of different okay. levels. Sally, is there something you desperately want to say on the coaching topic or should we move on? Move on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. We are going to, Coop's going to like this. We're going to bring in a Texan. Yes. He wants your best, 
non-cliched advice for running his first 100K. I believe it's coming up this weekend. Non-cliched. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So Aaron Davis, as you... Hi, uh, <laughs> there we go. Sorry, my audio is being funky. Okay, should we put you, we put uh, you back, in the, uh, back in the... Oop, oop. Should we put you should back, we put in, the you back in the waiting room? All right, All maybe, right. maybe. Okay, I put him back in the waiting room. Um, we are going to go, sorry. Let's go to, let's talk about mindset. We're gonna go to Jocelyn Chitster, I'm gonna guess. And she had a question about discouragement during training and ways to get out of negative headspace. And I'll let you elaborate on that, Jocelyn. Are you connected? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Hi, Jocelyn. Where are you calling, Hi, Jocelyn. Where are you calling from? <laughs> where are you at? Where are you calling zooming from? from? New Hampshire. <laughs> from the woods of New Hampshire. All awesome. right. Uh, so I was just curious about, obviously 2020 was the year of canceled races. So there's a, a lot of discouragement that a lot of runners had about not having like the next goal to train for. And I don't know about anybody else, but I'm going in 2021, assuming that a lot of races aren't going to happen as planned. So are there any ways of that you guys have found of working through the discouragement that kind of comes along with the goals being shifted around? Great question. Sally, why don't you start off? Yeah, I, I want to answer this in the best way. I'm, I'm, are, are, you just talking about just overall discouragement with uh, with like currently what's going on right now, or is it like like you're not seeing progress or you're not no just it? more overall stuff. Um, <laughs> progress varies day to day, as I feel like most of us can attest to. So it's more just overall discouragement. Like there are some days where it's kind of like, what's the point? Like the run might have been challenging, not be from a physical aspect, but more that a mental emotional point. Absolutely. I think one of the most important things to do, I, I'm, I'm huge on, on making a list. Um, I think making a list before you go to bed about what your day is going to be like the next day, what are the top things that you want to accomplish that day? Really, um, they set the, the tone for, for your next day workout. But it's important that as you wait, as you write, as you're writing that list, that you first understand the purpose of that workout. Every workout has a purpose and it, it should always be different. You know, some days it's recovery run, sometimes it's intensity, a long run. But when we're living in a world like we're in right now, where we, we don't know if we're going to be racing, we know, we don't know if there is a goal at the end of our training, it's still important that you identify the reason why you're going out for that run. And it doesn't even need to match up with what a training book says, or even what your coach said. If you, if uh, the only notes that you're given is like, Hey, this is an interval workout. I want you to do it at this effort for this duration that might not get you super excited. However, for you, there, there are other things in that run. There's reasons why you started running anyway. Jason spoke so wonderfully about this at the beginning of the podcast when you talked about having a why. And really, it's just going back to how that relates to everything in our life. Why, why do you take a shower? <laughs> you know, why do you eat food? You know, why do you connect with the people that you love? I mean, there's, there's really foundational reasons. There's roots as to why you do that. And running for, for you and like all of us, it truly is a gift. And so if you cannot find the purpose or the excitement in actually doing it, then find the reason to be thankful that you actually get to show up and, and be there. And sometimes that's all it is. You know, just because I do it for a living doesn't mean that I'm always stoked to get out for a training run. I think sometimes that the misconception is that the people that run a lot or that, that do it for a living or that coach, they're always stoked to get out there. But I'd say that maybe three days a week I am. And I, at, at the end of the day, it's realizing that you also need to find different things that motivate you. For me, if I'm having a day where I'm not motivated and I don't really feel like getting out, I don't even tell myself that I'm going to go run. I don't think, I don't let myself think. I just put my shoes on and I walk outside and sometimes I'll walk for a mile. 
before I even start running. And I have kind of garnered up over the years, all these different things that I'll use. They're kind of like my little security blankets. Well, then I'm going to try this and then I'm going to try this and I'm going to use this and I'm going to go through these things. And sure enough, there's usually something in there that's going to work. And so, you know, I want to encourage that for you come up. If it means writing it down, putting post-its on your, on your mirror that remind you, why are you showing up? Are you showing up for a race or are you showing up to be a better version of yourself? Running is so much more than, than the pace. Think about all the wonderful things it does for you mentally and physically, that time to think, the physical fitness that you're getting that's, you know, is really going to give you a healthy life for the people around you. I mean, there's so many things. You can make a list that how it impacts your life. And so um, don't lose that. I, I, I think collectively as a running community, we're all feeling that ache of not gathering, of not being able to race, but running is not canceled. And the reason why that you signed up and started doing this from the very, very, from day one, those reasons are still there. You just kind of got to dig them up. So. Yeah. Coop? Uh, I just want to pick up on a theme that Sally really uh, eloquently uh, went through. And that's, you can find really small things that you can use to create momentum. Mm. And for Sally, it's just putting on her shoes and walking out the door, right? That's a really small thing. She's not focused about crushing some, you know, huge mountain or setting a PR on her kettlebell swing or whatever else, you know, she's got kind of going on for the day. It's like the really simple things. And we know, we know this people, we know this from people who create lists. So everybody knows a list person. Sometimes the first thing they'll put on their list is make list and then they'll cross <laughs> off. Right? I, love it. <laughs> to, I accomplished I, something. Yeah, I call those the to done lists because yeah. you've yes. already like done some stuff. So you're yes. just like, just checking it off. I love a, that. Lot of, a lot of times you got to realize that a lot of times we can use those skills in running, right? So your mm -hmm. internal running checklist, sometimes oh, I have to have an awesome workout. I have to have a good run. I have to feel good and all this mm -hmm. other stuff. Sometimes it's just, you know, I got to put my shoes on. Okay. Now I got to tie my shoes. Okay. Now I got to open the door. Now I got to walk out the door. I've just done four things. That's pretty cool. You get the ball <laughs> rolling that way. Yep. So, so that's what, that's what I encourage. That's one of the things that Sally picked that Sally picked up on that I encourage my athletes to do that do kind of get in a rut is like, let's just start, let's just go back and we'll go back to the small things, smallest incremental gain possible that we can focus on for the day. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It was super validating to know that, that even Sally has those days where she doesn't <laughs> want to go out and do it. So uh, thank you so much. All right. Thank yeah, you, Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Stay well and out there. Thanks for bringing your cat into frame. Jocelyn. Oh my God. I, so they've been glad. gone the whole time. And then they just magically showed up that and I'm so sorry. I was trying to No, keep they saw the Billy's cat. They saw Billy's cat shirt and they knew they were, they, they were in the right place. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Bye, Jocelyn. Okay, sorry, Aaron, we are gonna get you on. Let's see if you are all set up. And we're still sideways. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. He's in his car, look at that. He paused for us in his car. Yeah, and he has I, a red, with red shirt. There you go. I made it, can y'all hear me? Yes, yeah, we can. Yeah, we can hear you, Aaron. Y'all should have left my goofy face on the screen the whole time, I was enjoying that. <laughs> What's your question, buddy? Um, yeah, so I, oh, shoot. I, that, that, um, that's a cool picture, too. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just my phone's not going sideways. Sorry. So <laughs> I, I'm running, uh, I'm running Bandera this weekend, first 100K. Um, I'm coming in slightly underprepared <laughs> because of the fact that I've just been so uh, marathon focused all year. Uh, bouncing from marathon to marathon, but kept getting canceled. Um, so I just wanted to ask for some like non-cliche advice for first 100K. And what I mean by that is like, everyone says like, oh, be sure to have a good time. Be sure yeah. to like have your nutrition down. One foot well, in front duh. of the other, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, duh, yeah. Like, I mean, I get all that. I got that. And, I love it. But, but just because I'm slightly, slightly underprepared and hopefully my coach isn't watching this or doesn't see this, but um, uh, you know, just some last minute advice. And I know Sally, I know you, I'm not sure about uh, Jason, but I know you have actually ran Bandera, so you may have some like course specific <laughs> stuff, but uh, yeah, anything would be great help. Yeah. Jason, you want to start? 
I was gonna let you take the lead with no, because I see you're like about to bust up laughing, and I want I want that to follow through. Okay, fair (laughs) enough. So, so this is your first hundred k, right? Am I? It's my first hundred k. I've done one fifty k, and I've done five marathons. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. So, with your background, right? You've done higher intensity endurance events, a lot of marathons and things like that. This is your first foray into a longer distance. And you have to realize that, and I'm sure you do, your coach, your coach has probably gone over this with you and you've probably internalized it, that it's more than 250 Ks, which is your longest distance to date right now. Oh. So for you, the real practical piece of advice that I would give is to start way slower than you think you need to. Way slower, like light years slower. The easiest run that you've ever done, the slowest pace run that you've ever done in your ever in your entire running career, slower than that. And you will not lose any time because of this, because you have a history of training, even though you have, you know, you've self self admittedly are going into this a little bit under train, you still have you know, many, many years of run training behind you, just guessing from your five, uh, from your five marathons, you're still going to need to start out ridiculously slow. And you know what, if that gives you more reserves towards the end of the race to run a little bit faster, great. But hang on, Coop, go, go one level deeper. Like, okay. So you're standing at the starting line, you, you get sent off and you have, you have this massive humanity that you're running with and you're just, I still have a hard time with it, you know, because it's a combination of ego, a combination of, well, that person shouldn't be, a, you know, in front of me or I look faster than them. Like, how do you actually put that into practice? Give us, let's get really deep sure, here. Sure. So here's the nitty gritty. Aaron, what, do, do you have a college degree? Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, what was man. your college degree in? <laughs> I'm going somewhere with this. No, we know. It's just so great. <laughs> Keep going. So, so, what was your college so degree in? Psychology. Psycho- oh, this is perfect. Oh, wow. This is <laughs> oh, this is awesome. I, I knew this. it. You're my people. That's so why I was like, please don't tell me like fluffy puppies and unicorns no, and right. hold on to that crap. Like, no, give me no, something you want, substantial. Did you have? Do you want my minor? Yeah, yeah. No, did you have a senior thesis? Yeah. Did you have a senior thesis that you had to draw up for your psychology degree? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yes. You should be able to dictate your entire senior thesis throughout the first course, the first part of the race without being out of breath. Oh, wow. That that's was how, that's how much you should have to talk. And you know how long that is and you know how hard it would be to verbalize even when you're standing at a podium, trying to verbalize that is, is a difficult task. That's how easy you should be running. That's how easy your effort level should be throughout the entirety of the first half of that race. Is that nitty gritty enough for you, Billy? That, that's good. I love it. Yeah. I mean, okay. that's what we, that's what we're looking for. That's what we're here for. That's the content we're here for. Yeah, man. <laughs> that's great. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to out your uh, degree, Aaron. But... Uh, okay. No, I just, can I, can I, I tell I you something buried, practical? I had suppressed all of that already. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's been, you know, years and years. So I'm like, I'm, I'm moving past it. It's Kelly, right. real yeah, quick, it's go ahead. Yes. So there's like this, um, I did race it last year. I had a horrible race. There is this extremely like, there's a crazy plant out there. And I'm not just talking about like the cacti. You don't need to wear like special stuff. Like you'll probably get cut up, but it's not a big deal, but it, it, it's really minor, but there's like this super potent tree or bush that's out there that, that, just exasperates people's allergies like to the nth power um so i don't know if you if you have any allergies see i have very slight allergies and i was i could i i could not breathe the whole race like i had such a hard time the entire race and it was so funny because i picked up a pacer for my second loop it was a guy that had done the race before And I was like, dude, I have no idea what's wrong with me. Like I'm having trouble breathing. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, there's this crazy, like potent bush out here. (laughs) Like it sent, he's all, it sent my daughter to the hospital. I'm like, awesome stuff. I should have known before I ran this race. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. If you're not feeling great, when you, when you get there the days before, and maybe if you have medicine that you can take or something like that, um, But what, what Jason was saying, it is, that is like really good advice for the first hundred K go slower than you think it's two loops. 
Um, so that's kind of nice. So kind of use the first loop as like recon. Okay, this is what I'm gonna be doing the second loop. This is where I'm really gonna be picking up the pace here. Like you can really like explore and get to know um, the course. It's a, it's a really well put together race. I'm excited for you. You're gonna do great. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to eat, it. eat and drink well. I'm just going to say that too. I think that's key. And once, you know, in the longer the race is, it's, it really is key to be disciplined to eat and drink well. That's going to take you to the finish line much stronger. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, it, I don't want to discount the effort that I have put in with my coach. So I'm not blaming him for <laughs> feeling underprepared. It's definitely me. <laughs> so. We don't know who your coach is. It's okay. <laughs> well, you know, well, you know, my coach, you just don't know who it is. So it's all right. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go do Google searches now. Let's Morgan. see. Mario is on yeah. here. So it's not Mario. Uh, I would just <laughs> like to point, I just like to point out the allergic reaction thing. That's really, that is pro, that is pro level reconnaissance sense right there yeah that's really good and i I actually do have really bad allergies but i my i guess one advantage is that i do live in the area so but i don't go out there a lot so that's it it will i'm sure i will be affected by it so thank you for that all right thank you aaron thanks guys i really appreciate it yeah Yeah. for sure all the best to you thank you so there's going to be i think the theme is going to be with this uh with this talk today we're going to start off at that 250 mile distance and then we're going to slowly <laughs> work our way down in distance because we have, let me see, Laura. Oh, the, the comments in here are hilarious. Coop, recite your philosophy <laughs> thesis. Next level advice right there. <laughs> Ooh, Billy, people, are, people know that you're on the, on the Western States board. They want mm-hmm. you to speak up. Come on, spill the beans. Nothing to report on that front. I'm sorry. But we do have Laura on and Laura has a question for you guys. Hello, Laura. Where are you, where are you zooming from? Um, so I ran my first 50K um, a couple weeks ago, actually. And I'm looking to make the jump from 50K to 100K. And um, just, I mean, I know that there's so many resources out there, but I mean, I guess like, what's the biggest difference? I mean, I know it's longer, long runs. I have... Um, some, you know, I've integrated some core training and, um, you know, a little bit of body weight stuff, but what just, I don't really know what I'm getting into. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jason, I, I would love to hear you take this one, but first I just want to say it is wonderful to meet you, Laura. And I was like, I, as when you said I'm making the jump from, I kind of held my breath there. Because lately I've been hearing a lot of, I'm making the jump from a half marathon to a 250 mile race. <laughs> like, like how often do we hear that, right? It's like, I got to do that right away. So um, anyway, I just had to interject that. It's it's just a fun. <laughs> we're going to be seeing a lot more of that because ultra running, ultra running is like the first endurance sport that's going to be back. So we're going to get all the roadies. I know. And I can guarantee you. Yeah. Okay. So Laura, here's the deal. You, you've done all the work. I can, I guarantee you if they would have changed the 50 K distance to hundred K distance at the last minute, you would have been fine. The training is really not that much different. It might be 5% difference in terms of what you would change from one to the other. And it's mainly just packing in more volume from a strict programmatic standpoint. So yeah, your long runs are going to be a little bit longer, not double the length, right? But a little bit longer, five, 10% longer, whatever you can, whatever you can put in you will not have the opportunity to make as many nutrition mistakes as you made in your 50k if you made any in your 50k so i would encourage you to go through that inventory kind of first and foremost okay what did i do what did i eat what did i drink did i have any sort of like sour spots or anything like that because those elements are the one that's the one of the things that gets magnified more than the distance So the distance is getting magnified twofold. Any sort of nutritional pitfalls that you had during the 50K will get magnified four or eightfold because of the extra stress that that volume puts on your system. So from a sheer training standpoint, unless you're an elite athlete, and even then, 
the, the training isn't really all that difference between 150K and 100K. It's be, and that's because the intensity is markedly the same. Yeah, you want to do a little bit more volume, but in terms of the overall architecture, it's really, really not that different. So my, the, my counsel to you is you've got the tools, right? You can rinse and repeat whatever you did for this 50K because it was obviously successful. You, you finished it and yeah, you're going to make tweaks and things like that. That's normal with any athlete but you don't have to completely change whatever was successful for you all that much. So outside of adding a little bit of volume, I think you got all the tools. Sally. Jason nailed it. Okay. Yeah, that's good. All right. In the interest of time, Laura, we're going to uh, pop you off, but thank you. Hopefully we answered your question, right? Yeah. Good luck. What yes. hundred K are you doing? Um, I, honestly, I'm just waiting to see what's what's even happening. I'm signed up for Promised Land 50K though, so that's going to be exciting. I'm stoked. Cool, awesome. right? So, are okay. you on the East Coast? Yes, I'm in Southern Virginia. So. Oh, okay, awesome. I, I've heard of that one. Yeah, it's. That's, I'm terrified, yeah. but it'll be fun. Yeah. It'll be a good time. Those are my yeah. mountains. I train in those. So. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Laura. Okay, um, Coop, I'm going to pose this question to you. This is from Russell House, because um, you have a famous athlete on your roster. How does one train for a race with major sustained climbs when they don't live in an area with major sustained climbs? And um, this person specifically called out outside of treadmills. How do they get that work, uh, the hill work in? This is the most frequently asked question that I get. Uh, of all time, like the number one at, at, at the very top of the list. Other than is Billy really as handsome in person as he is in <laughs> I do not, the I've Zoom never chats? Gotten, I've never gotten that question because you are so stunning, <laughs> irrespective of the format, Billy. Um, so the so the first thing to keep in mind is that fitness wins. Fitness trumps everything. We get way too caught up in the modality and how much hiking we're doing and how much vertical gain and vertical loss and blah, 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 blah. And we have to do all of these completely contrived things to make up for the training terrain that we don't have that we're going to encounter on race day. And in my, in my opinion, in a lot of training that I just observe with athletes and with other coaches, we over contrive the need to overcome those types of deficiencies in our, in, in our training environment. So the first thing to realize is just that your fitness is going to win and you should not under any circumstances change what you are doing in training to suit a particular modality, uphill running, downhill running or whatever at the expense of your overall fitness. And so let me give you a completely asinine example of that. Let's just say for whatever reason, you're really scared about your quads blowing up on the downhills, whatever that means, right? Quads blowing up on the downhills. Yeah. <laughs> you need to, my, 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 actually, my favorite piece of vocabulary from that is, is you need to season your quads, which I'm a Texan and I'm a medium Texan. Seasoning something, seasoning a piece of meat involves salt and pepper and spice, not downhill running. But I don't so let's say that for whatever reason you live in a really flat level ground you just live in the midwest you don't have climbs and things like that and you're going to something like hard rock where you know that you're going to have to contend with a lot of downhills some runners will take these completely over contrived scenarios and drag tires and do lunges for miles and reverse lunges back for miles and things like that in order to quote unquote season their quads Whenever they do that at the expense of the fitness gains that they could have gotten from just a normal run, that's a huge training error. So the first thing is, is a range of training architecture such that you're just getting as fit as possible. This is still a cardiovascular event. Let's not forget that, right? Ultra running is a cardiovascular event first and foremost. So outside of that, you can, you need to try to do whatever you can to get into a hilly, a hilly environment. And it doesn't take much. And we know this from all the strength training research that Sally is very well aware of. There's this phenomenon called the repeated bout effect mm -hmm. that is classically studied in, e in an eccentric condition. So a lengthening contraction of the muscle fiber, which is 
kind of renowned to be deleterious in this downhill condition. That's when we, when we describe our quads as being shot. Essentially, what is happening from a mechanical standpoint is that they're actively being lengthened against a very large force. We know that a good way to combat that is just with eccentric exercise. And we also know that it, that type of exercise is extremely potent, so potent that this term, repeated bout effect, has come about because all it takes is one bout to protect your body against subsequent bouts. And so the reason that I bring that up in this context is it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much descending to quote unquote season your quads for a mountainous event. It doesn't take weeks and weeks and months and months. All it could take is one training intervention, right? One training camp that you get out to the course or you go and you travel or something like that. If you spend just a, just even a few days, even a, a three, four, five days of your entire training, which might be 150 or 200 days, doing some sort of uphill, downhill stuff, that's gonna accomplish maybe 90% of what you could do by training on the hard rock course the entire time. That's how potent this repeated bout effect actually is in, in, in physiology. So for the athletes that don't have the, the vertical gain and vertical loss, fret not, focus on your fitness first. And then even if you have limited access to climbing and descending, I think that that is a better use of your time to get that limited access versus trying to create all of the other over contrived training situations that we see that are all too common that you could pull from the old ultra list serve. Does anybody remember the old ultra list serve? Oh, you're dating yourself. Coop. Oh, I know. Right. That's where we got <laughs> all of our training information. Any of those old, like over contrived modalities, I don't think are really worth it. If you get just a few days of training in the mountains, just because that effect is so powerful. Sally, do you have something you desperately want to get in on that topic or should we move no, on? No, it, it was, it was so good. Cause I get asked that a lot too. And, and yeah, I hear athletes say things like, well, I'm just going to do a ton of squats. And I'm like, uh, that's not the same as, as getting in some downhill. And so typically if someone lives in Florida or just somewhere that's really flat, um, going off of what Jason was saying, I said, well, over the, this phase of your training, as we leading up to your race, all we need is a handful of days. Can you, is there any time within these four or five months that you can drive out somewhere to get on a mountain? Cause yeah, that's, you just need that handful of time. It is a cardiovascular event. It, you are in that aerobic zone. So cr creating that massive aerobic base, increasing that capacity to be able to endure more. Um, I think we often overlook that. We, we want to make things more complicated than hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay, Mark is joining us from the yeah. great Pacific Northwest, and he has a question Mark! about self coaching. Oh, hey. I've been in a while. Wow, your beard is amazing, Mark. <laughs> beard is so bigger nice. than the last time I saw it. It's so, so good Santa to see Claus. you. <laughs> good to see you. Hopefully, my mic is working. You guys You're... can hear me. Looks like oh, it's yeah. You, you, you got the tech thing down. We're, we're getting the computer audio, I think, because it's a little more tinny, but it's okay. And it's okay. coming from my AirPods. So, I, I... Oh, okay. Yeah. But I hear it good. So mine's a little bit different question. Uh, I was thinking about this today, running, listening to Billy and Mario talk about his cat t-shirt. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Jim Walmsley doesn't use a coach. Zach Miller doesn't use a coach. Courtney DeWalter doesn't use a coach. You can't argue with their success, but I'm curious for Sally and Coop's perspective, do you think they would perform better with a coach? What, can, mm. can I pause for a second though? They, they were at one time coached. <laughs> if, I, if I'm right, they, they were college athletes, weren't they, Coop? Yes, they were. And I and have I a lot of strong opinions about this. So, yeah. so you better get your stuff out of the way first. Before, <laughs> I know. That's all I, I have to say. Because I mean, sometimes, okay. cause sometimes people. You guys fair warning. Sometimes Coop. people will. will you no, know, I've heard this before too. Because people have brought that up to me as well. I like and, the wine. I, I was going to ask a question about intermittent fasting. But I figured this was a better <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a difference between someone that's never been coached ever. And like doesn't sure. know anything. And trying to figure it out. And then someone that has been coached for years and actually understands programming and different workouts and things like that. But I'm, I'm gonna stop there. Okay, Coop, so. try to limit your answer to under 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. 
under 15 minutes. Would, I, I think that, so yes is the short answer. I think that any of those athletes underneath the guidance of a well-seasoned, experienced, high quality coach, those are the caveats that I'm putting on that, not just any coach, yeah. would always perform better. And here's how I know that with all due respect to those athletes mm -hmm. is I can look at any aspect of their training or nutrition or preparation and I can find holes in it. And I have done that. I've done that with all of those people that you just mentioned. And we've talked about it. I mean, I've seen, I see them at races. I saw Courtney just a couple of weeks, it's a few weeks ago out in uh, the lake, uh, uh, out in the Leadville area. And I, I, I use that as an example, not to say that they're doing the wrong things, because as you mentioned, Mark, they are very successful. Yeah. But whenever you have an objective set of eyes on it that is used to looking at those scenarios, there are always improvements that you can that you can absolutely tease out of it. So that is my humble and very biased, <laughs> but yet very experienced, very experienced mm -hmm. uh, 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 opinion on that. Yeah. Even when we see the highest performers, if they get there by themselves in an endurance discipline. If they get there by themselves, they can, they are still well served to get professional counsel outside of their own self. And we, and that, that's not just limited to coaching. That's limited mm -hmm. to that. You can also extend that to psychology, nutrition, yeah. Yeah. all of these yeah. other things that play into endurance performance are always, are, are almost always better served with professionals that do it on a day-to-day -day basis and not the athletes, mm -hmm. even yeah. in the highest level situations. 100, 150% agree. And Jason, and I, I know you know this too, you see this across all professions, you know, a Correct. psychologist Correct. goes to a psychologist, you know, and, and you see people that, um, that even if they are coached, like I, I, I'm coached by Mario and benefit that I get from him is, is all the mental stuff for me. Like I need somebody to talk through stuff and strategize. Like it, it isn't, I don't need him to motivate me to go train, but some people, we need coaches for different reasons and different aspects, but I desperately need a coach because I need someone to look at me from the outside and point out the things that I don't see. And that's right. just normal human nature in every part of our yeah. lives. Right. So, yeah. um, but no, I, I have so much respect for those athletes. But I also believe that we are, um, if we put ourselves in a position where we are students for life, then we can always, always grow because we're not perfect. Shout out to those three people. I love all of you. Oh, I know, I know, had, me too. <laughs> we have had these conversations, so they will know. And if they listen to this, they'll be like, yeah, I know, I realize that. And sometimes they've listened to me when I've given that counsel and sometimes they <laughs> haven't. But the point, the point, the, like, the point is, is I, I do think that even when we see the highest of highest performers, they're, they are very well served to have outside counsel across a number of different uh, mm -hmm. areas and coaching being one of them. Yeah. Well, thanks for your answer. All right. Thank okay. you, Mark. Good to see you, Mark. Really good question. Right. I love Jason. Aaron Davis in the chat room says, Coop's vocab is fire. I got my dictionary and thesaurus out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> Welcome to the nerdery, everyone in the chat room. My vocabulary <laughs> is usually like just below that of Liz's high school, my wife's high school freshman. Oh so my God, it's I good. Do. I love listening to you. You know, my former life uh, working on a liquor and wine shop, I think every now and again, if you inject the right words, you sound like 10 times more intelligent than you are. You know, you work in like tannins and you work in words like robust and people are like, oh my God, he's like a wine sommelier. <laughs> I have some breaking news. Okay. I have some breaking news. I just got a text and a beautiful photo of one Rylan Ivy Grunewald. Oh my they, God, what? Justin what? and Amanda just had their baby Aww. and she is gorgeous. I thought you were gonna say that your breaking news was that you were pregnant. Cause that's the thing <laughs> right now. Everybody's <laughs> pregnant and having kids. Yeah, science hasn't figured that, <laughs> cracked that code yet, but um. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. I shout out to Justin and Amanda. Yes, and Amanda. I was texting with Amanda today. She was like 10 hours into labor. <laughs> she was texting you 10 hours into labor? What's the matter with her? She's got an epidural. Okay. <laughs> Our friend Allison has a question about your guys' tentative race schedules. I want to hear what Sally's doing. <laughs> 
I, <laughs> Sally's always got interesting stuff cooking. Is it like secret now? Or no, you... no. Oh. I honestly, it's, I, I get so excited. I, I got my list of, of the races that I have and most of them are overseas. And so it really just, I'm, I'm trying to just keep a positive, hopeful mind that we're going to be able to travel um, at some point this year. So um, the races that are on my list right now, as far as being in the United States, I have one and that's bad water. <laughs> oh so <laughs> Jason, we need to talk later on. Coop, you've done bad water, right? I yeah. have. I've been out of bad water many, many years. Now. Right. I know you've been out there. Myself. I forget if you raced it's, it. It's insane. It's, it's a, a weird, race. it's a weird race. I think it's, it's harder. So I think beautiful. it's harder now with the night start because everybody, oh I think it's more dangerous too. To, to, um, if I'm being honest with everybody, I agree. Um, yeah, that's a <laughs> dumb, did it in move 2018. By, dumb, dumb move by the by the park service. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, that race is so hard. It's it's crazy, um, and then everything else is is out of uh, country. I was supposed to. Um, a lot of them are like, hey, then just come back next year. So a handful of races on the tour, um, a race in Italy and Iceland. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess I'll just pause there. I'm just going to say right now I have one race in country and it's bad water. No, <laughs> what about you, Jason? No, yeah. um, I'm doing a Tahoe 200. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's right. Ooh. Yeah. What month is that? September. That's sept okay. Yeah. Okay. So you have some good time to prepare for it. Have, have you started like programmed training or are you just working on the base and getting some aerobic miles in right no, now <laughs> i'm doing intervals i did seven by three this morning like i'm doing all oh, the high intensity stuff that's a, right now that's a good workout nice yeah okay we have let's see billy you're not going to say what you're doing yeah billy we want to know what you're doing yeah i don't think i have anything on my schedule i have a, an adventure run in march that may or may not happen COVID dependent outside of an that ad an adventure run like yeah, like a like a race adventure one, like a no, stage like race? a like a local oh, DIY okay. adventure run. Oh, okay. Yeah, Trina, mm -hmm. let's get Trina in here. It's a secret adventure run, people. Because I'm trying to. Think I've told you, you, Sally. I've told you. Oh, okay. Yeah. The one that had to be postponed from last year. Exactly. Precisely. Around a special holiday. <laughs> yes, precisely. <laughs> Okay. Let's, let's keep code speaking word. in code. Let's, let's keep like, speaking in code. Like dating or something. <laughs> Hi, Trina. Trina. Oh my God. Okay. Oh, we're it's so good to see your face. Oh my. Okay. Turn down your uh, stream volume if you don't mind, Trina. You turned it off. Okay. Trina, your uh, stream volume. Mm -hmm. Hi, Trina. Okay. Yeah, I'll just mute her for the time being. <laughs> oh, wait, that's not coming from her. Oh, no, that is. Okay. It could be her phone. Right, if me... She has her phone on too. I'm going to mute Trina again. I'm surprised that we didn't run into that much technical difficulty I know, outside of Aaron the, and this is the, our first time doing it. And look at all the people in the chat room. It's so wonderful. So as we're pausing right here, Troy yeah. Blackman, it is good to <clears> see <throat> your little icon face in the chat. Yes, I do remember meeting you at Badwater in 2018. Um, let's say hi to some of these people in here. Yeah, Kelly's in there. By the way, uh, weight of weight of the baby is 7.6. Yeah. Oh, chubby my cheeks gosh. so sweet so rad sub 24 oh, western states is coming billy yes jonathan but i have to get in first and just because i'm on the board does not bump me to the front Whatever. of the line you one that caveat Whatever. out there really quick you know but he thing. will be you pulling know, the, the moment names. that you get in everybody's <laughs> no. gonna start throwing shade that you he's pulling exactly oh billy yang is in <laughs> well people are already suspecting that after i made the film about sally it was the very next year i got in with like two tickets <laughs> yeah, it's all a conspiracy theory. <laughs> okay, let's see if Trina is set up for us. Okay, not quite yet, Trina. <laughs> I gotta mute you again. I'm sorry. We'll work it out. You just have to mute the live stream volume and then um, we'll get you on in the Zoom. I know it's like dueling windows here. 
Any other questions or comments in the chat room that you yeah. see? Yeah, Redneck Biker 109 said, this is great. Mm -hmm. I love all the advice. You should do okay, this more like often, that. please. <laughs> Okay. Maybe maybe we that, will. That wasn't a question. That was a comment. <laughs> Just a to comment. clarify the difference between um, those two things, Sally. We should do these all the time. Maybe, <laughs> please. <laughs> Let um, me see. Uh, there was a question about. Uh, no, there from, is. There was from, actually a lot of questions in here, and I think there was one for Coop. Um, Coop. You know. Yeah, the, you there was a conversation was about Lowry. community. Oh, okay, I was gonna ask him about the one from Beth. Oh, okay, okay, do do that one. Yeah, uh, Beth O'Neill moved from Durango to, uh, where are you again? Colorado Springs, oh, that's Springs. right. And she's struggling to find her people. Oh. And obviously with COVID being what it is, that's probably just piling on to her, um, you know, her issues, but what would be like, is there a training group or some like yeah. group of people that yeah, you can there, connect there's with? There's actually a really awesome group of runners here that you and I's mutual friend Dreama runs with a lot. Uh, and that's the crud runner C R U D. Um, so go look them up on Facebook or just hit me up <laughs> offline and I'll point you in the right direction. They're, they're a really, really high quality group of, of, of people that do okay. awesome runs, all Hence different the name. abilities. Yeah. Awesome <laughs> runs, all different abilities and just cool, just cool people. Okay. Let's try Trina again. I think you're set up. Trina. Can you hear me? Yes. There we go. Okay. Yay. All right, Yay! floor is yours. Welcome to Billy Yang Podcast Live. Thank you. It's good to see you, Sally. It's so good to see your wonderful face again and following your journeys. I yes. miss you. I miss you too. <laughs> so how so, can we help you today? So, um, okay, so Sally and I kind of have a connection that she might not even know, but... I come from the same similar background with abuse and being disconnected with a, with a parent. And that parent is currently passing away. And I just came from Washington state. And um, so I'm going through a process of a lot of grief, a lot of unpacking things. And um, I tried to run a little bit when I was out there and I can just feel that it's so heavy on me and I'm having a really hard time knowing how to work through this and train through this and keep going. I'm motivated towards some events I have, but my body just feels so off and so wrong and it's just so heavy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I should push through that and, and, and go forward or should I just step back and, and process this grief and then try to go back to training. Yeah. Well, first and, and foremost, thank you for sharing that. And I, I, I do know a lot of people and you just sharing that so boldly and courageously, I know a lot of people are going to be able to, to relate and yeah. um, hopefully find comfort in, in this conversation as well. You're not alone in it. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm so sorry, uh, first and foremost, that, that you had to experience that in growing up. And I think that, you know, what we feel emotionally, you know, heartache and pain, I mean, what we feel emotionally, it is many times it can feel, uh, it, it, it comes out in us physically as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way that the body reacts to stress, it's the same both physically and, and mentally. We, we get exhausted by it. And so um, everything that you're feeling, it, it, makes, it makes perfect sense. And um, now you said you just got back from Washington. Did you go and see this, the parent? Mm -hmm. Is that what yeah. you're doing? Was, yeah. that to say, was that to say goodbye? Is that your... Right, kinda, right. Well, okay. yeah because yeah. it, you know, it's all locked down. So you yeah. have to be on hospice to go in there. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. You know, and then I tried actually right before I left to come back, I went to the Columbia River Gorge and did a run with some friends and I could just feel that, I, was, I don't know, it's just like, it's so mm -hmm. deep and, and your legs yeah. just feel wrong and, and running it, like you want to be there running and you want to take it in, but you just want to mm -hmm. fall on the ground and come mm -hmm. apart, so to yeah. speak. All right. So I'm just going to, I'm going to be super raw and just real with you right now. Just heart to heart, Trina, because, um, first and foremost, this, this doesn't have to do with, with your running. You got to separate 
those two things for you to get out and move on your two feet while trying to digest this stuff. You want to be gracious to yourself because even just getting out for a walk and being able to think about these things is so healthy. It is good. It's a lot better than, than laying in bed and, and just right. staying in bed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of adding intensity when your body is already experiencing something so intense, um, right. give your body grace right now, give your heart grace. You know, um, I know I've shared my story, different parts of my story. I write a lot of it actually in my book, but there, there comes a point in our life when, when we've been hurt so deeply by someone, um, there's two sides we can take one where we kind of stand in like this victim mud pit waiting for that person to say they're sorry. And when that never, ever comes, we wear that. We can wear that like a wet blanket and it bleeds out into every area and every relationship in our life. Mm -hmm. But you do have the power to forgive somebody, even when they don't ever ask for forgiveness, because right. forgiveness is what sets you free. It's what heals you and what allows you to move on. It allows you to release that weight. And it is okay if you have somebody that didn't love you, didn't treat you the way and see you the way that you should be that you don't have to wear that. You're not responsible for that, but you can forgive that parent and love that parent for who they are in their world. And you can move up the mountain in that, right? You can keep yes. moving on in that. And so there is a time for everything in our life. There's a season for everything that happens in our life. And we all go through these ups and downs, the loss, the pain, the grief, being hurt deeply by people. This is a part of your humanness and just who you are and in your journey. And this is also what is what makes you so great, Trina, because even through all of this, you're still wanting to get outside and live. You're still mm -hmm. wanting to show up and live your life to the fullest. And that really is what you were made to do. You were made to live despite all of that hurt. And so you can take that pain, you can take that hurt, what is going on, and you can very much just release it, forgive that pain and just keep going. But I'd say as you relate it to your running, Take it as a recovery time. This is your, your rest period to let your heart rest, to let it rejuvenate. But there's no doubt that that fresh air that you're getting, that sunshine, being outside, allowing yourself to kind of work through this, it's very healthy. So I wish I could just come through the screen and give you a big old hug because oh. <laughs> you are such a wonderful woman. And I, I had the chance of coaching you for a while and loved every interaction I had with you. I, mm. I wish so much and, and hope that you know how valuable and wonderful you are. You are so loved. And um, I really hope for comfort and peace in this time as you, as you say goodbye. Thank you. Thank, yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Trina. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, I think, um, you know, just to piggyback off that, I've been through many uh, instances in my life where I use running as a vehicle, as a way to process grief, as a way to, workout problems and running will always be there. So even if it's just out, I think it's so therapeutic now more than ever to just get that time and throw pace out the window, throw time and distance out the window, just make sure you get out there and, and go through the process, allow yourself to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get a little more prescriptive. And then I am, I am well aware of the time where I could do this all night, but we are right? kind of up against it. Um, okay, so Javin Bowie has been Hounding me on the chat room <laughs> to get his question in. I think I've seen that. Oh yeah, I've, I've seen that. So one. he is doing a last man standing event, which I think okay. uh, it's safe to say the three of us don't really have any experience in that regard. But maybe you guys as coaches have some thoughts. Thirty by five k. Is that right? Thirty by. <laughs> so it's not. Is it a last man standing or is it anyway? So 5K loops, advice on pacing between loops. Uh, should you do them slow and rest more or walk some and go slower? Some thoughts, guys. <laughs> the last man standing event. You want me to go I think that's Sally? what it was. Oh, uh, yeah. I... Oh, yeah. So <laughs> these events are always really interesting because it's like the the fitness it doesn't matter as much, right? Fitness usually is the great equalizer. Uh, and the great, it, sorry, not the great equalizer. It's the great differentiator in most endurance events. And here it really, it honestly doesn't matter all that much. 
you can put a lot of time and effort into how you pace each loop, but really at the end of the day, it's only making a very minuscule amount of difference in terms of the amount of the interlupal time, which I love that term as well, that uh, <laughs> Laz uses out of, over um, Parkley. Um, so what, what I encourage athletes to do that are getting into these last man or last person standing events is to try to just maintain things as evenly as possible throughout the course of the entirety of however long you can go. And it sh the intensity should not be any different than any normal endurance run that you go out and do. If you're not as fit and you have to press yourself a little bit to complete those loops, which, you know, I have athletes that are let's just say five hour marathoners that have done some of these standard, uh, bigs backyard ultras. They have to push themselves a little bit to complete each loop. And that's fine because that's, you got what you got, but trying to undulate your pace to take advantage of a little bit more time and in the interlupal time or time it in some other ways, I kind of think is a fool's errand because the cost of having those having that undulation in terms of the stress that it plays on you either the physical stress or the psychological stress of oh am, am i going to make it or am, or am i pushing myself too hard really isn't really isn't kind of all that all that worth it so i don't think that the pacing in these need to be needs to be really in incredibly complicated I think the bigger thing is, is to have your support system of wherever your home base is, depending upon the setup, set up as efficiently as possible and practice that in training, go out and do a 5k loop or a two mile loop or whatever, and see and actually feel what that time is going to be in between those loops and figure out what you can and cannot do in between each one of those loops, can you change your shoes? Can you change your socks? Can you change out this piece of your gear? Can you do this thing? Can you go to the bathroom? What combinations of those things can you actually do in those loops? And if you know those combinations of things, it just makes the whole process easier. Now, on the question of should you run or should you walk? I think in any ultra marathon and, and, uh, and uh, the, the last person standing events are great examples of this you're better served as long as you can continue to make cutoffs or continue to make your time goals or whatever they are to incorporate more walking as opposed to more running. And that's just because there is an absolute physical like load off of your legs when you change that, when you change those modalities, that is usually worth the time penalty that you pay when you're reducing your speed from a run to a walk. So as much as you can, absolutely you know, walk some and then practice that in training. Any thoughts, Allie? Nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Look, um, we're kind of up against it. We've been uh, going for about hour 45 now. <laughs> And it's um, been so fun. It's been fun. And, and maybe... I've seen a lot of, a lot of people in the <clears throat> chat room have said that we're, we're saving them from doing other things. Yeah. It's about to say watching, <laughs> watching other things. <laughs> the they cycle, could be the better here. We might want to <laughs> yeah. let's like, keep, let's get a pot of coffee going. <laughs> <laughs> saving the world. Yeah. An hour at a so spreading, spreading kindness and joy. Right. <laughs> Uh, look, there were a ton of questions I didn't get around to, or we didn't get around to as a group, to Jen, to Connie, to Margaret, mm, uh, all of you guys. Maybe we will do this in the future um, again, because I've, you know, I've learned a lot too, as I said in the chat. This is, um, Me you know, too. to be in the presence of uh, great minds like Sally's and Coop's, <laughs> there's always something to be learned. So uh, Sally, maybe you in particular should do this more often. Maybe this is a conversation we should continue to have offline. Continue As we to have, have been doing, yes, for continue the, to have. For like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Billy's been trying to get me to do a show for, for no, probably like seven years. Okay. Yeah. Well, we don't have to get into it now, but yeah, I think Sally, <laughs> you're just a natural at this, as are you, Coop. In that vein, Coop, why don't you plug your Coopcast and tell people where they can find it and what they can expect to, um, yeah, what they could expect to hear. Me. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Apparently, Sally's, which she's kind of like, okay, I got, I got the hell to my head now. <laughs> um, so my podcast is going to be all about Sally McRae going forward. <laughs> That's what the listeners can expect. I'm going to, I'm going to change the name of the podcast to the Sally McRae podcast <laughs> with Jason Coop. That's how you can find it. 
and we're going to Jason will be on his training. keyboard on the side, like doing like the show music. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With the punchlines. Um, uh, <laughs> um, you can find the podcast anywhere. I have a, obviously a, a eclectic group of guests that come in everywhere from like really high level physiologists. I've got the guy who just wrote the British Journal of Sports Medicine uh, paper on athletes' uh, hearts and the concerns that they've had returning from COVID. Uh, mm. So anywhere from like super mm. like technical things like that to real athletes, you know, talking about their training to our own coaching staff, talking about how to organize training to people on the Western States board. Maybe Billy can come on in that capacity since that's your new gig now. <laughs> um, you can find it anywhere. It's Coop spelled with a K. Yes. And <laughs> Training Essentials for Ultra Running, his book is out wherever you can buy books. No, it's not. At oh, it's officially out of print. Oh, look Whoa. at you. Yeah. So quick okay. story. So I, I went through this uh, small publisher called Vela Press to, to do the first edition. And I already went, I w already went through that story. The second edition got coveted. So the publisher came back after this was like in March or something like that, after I'd finished like ha half of the revised content. And they said, we're not publishing any new books until the end of 2021. And so I said, okay, I want the rights to the book. So I acquired the rights to the, uh, to the book. And that means the first book is officially out of print as of last week. You can probably pick up the remaining copies in the far corners of the internet. Um, and the second edition of the book should be out in like April. Awesome. Excellent. And it's awesome. I'm really psyched about the content. Yes. It's a lot of it. It's a lot of content. I'm kind of. Oh, like, Coop, uh, let's we... plug, hang on, let's plug your certification program. The you, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation. USCA. So you, yeah, USCA. Yeah, I'm super psyched about this because it's what I wanted when I first started coaching. Like I, like Sally, I've had every certification known on planet earth, USA cycling, USA triathlon, USA track and field. I've got all the manuals up here over my right shoulder still to this day. And I hated all of them. I, I just hated it. <laughs> and also when I was a uh, coaching director at CTS, it was a requirement for our entire network of coaches to have one NGB certification when we did it for a variety of reasons, but it was always a painstaking task because it was really expensive to maintain all of those every single year and not incredibly valuable with all due respect to the fine folks over at those national governing bodies. They just were the utility in it was just not very good. And so finally, USCA approached me about creating an ultra running specific coaching certification, which is just one of those where I'm like, is there really a market for this people? Like, come on, like you, like whatever. So I did it a little bit just to see if there was a, like a market for it. And I really like the content. I really like what they do and I hate certifications. I'm not just saying that because I was a, a part of it. I just, I, I find that the way that they organize the content and also the support that they give to their coaches after the fact is everything that I wanted for the first 15 years of my career when I was managing that across an entire coaching department. So I'm super psyched about that. The acronym is UESCA and you can get running certification from them, uh, uh, ultra running now, uh, to soon to be cycling and also a triathlon certification for them. The content is really, really good. They've done a good job curating it. That's awesome. awesome. I need to check that out. Yeah, it's cool. At Yellow Runner, at Sally McRae on Twitter. What do you want to plug, Sally? Um, you know, I, I would like to say thank you because a lot of people brought this up in the chat room and I was off social media for like over a month and I, I came back to a, a few thousand more followers and a lot of my messages were um, people saying thank you for the iFit sessions. And so I, I'm a new iFit trainer. I've been doing it for about a year now and they released, um, I think there's like 20 something workouts um, on the Nordic track, or if you have like the iFit, you can do the iFit app too. But anyway, I've had so much fun interacting with people and I, I haven't been able to get back to everyone's messages. So for those of you that wrote in the chat room, um, and for anyone that is, that's here that has sent me a message on Instagram, I'm sorry, I've been able to respond to all of them, but thank you so much for doing my workouts. And, um, yeah, iFit's been fun and I hope to run with you again, uh, soon. Is it yeah. a treadmill workout, Sally, or they're like strength training stuff there too? Um, they, they only have hired me for the treadmill stuff. I've, I've, 
they have other trainers that do the strength training stuff, which, um, yeah, I don't think I like fit in. The- <laughs> you, you don't get what you're saying. I, I know. Yeah. That world, so I, got you. <laughs> I like I show up with like my ex- dirty trail cap. Like I do. Yeah, I, it's so I funny. It. I don't look I like all it. the other trainers, I but it's, it. but I love it because, um, they've been amazing to me and have been able to really, um, plug in just trail running. And so, I've had so much fun just talking about trail running and etiquette and the sport itself and our community and just really having an opportunity to put our sport into um, a bright light because I, I think our sport is a bright light. But yeah, Jason, we should get you on there. I want, we, no, I just want to get I want to get swole with Sally McRae. That should be your <laughs> that should be your podcast. I just gave you the idea right there. Getting I'm swole with market. Sally McRae. Getting swole with Sally McRae. You see that shirt? I'm gonna, swole with Sally. Yeah, I'm trademarking it and I'll sell it to you afterwards. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for joining us. This will be in podcast form. So if you'll allow me to take care of some business at the end of it, um, at Billy Yang Pod on Instagram, Billy Yang Podcast on Facebook, although I probably should be posting more on Facebook. I just (laughs) don't. Um, I want to thank, so patreon.com slash Billy Yang. If you enjoyed the show, please consider. Um, I do want to thank certain pledges who donated a certain amount and above. Katrin Ulrich, who didn't say where she's from. Michael Jones from Richmond, Virginia. Welcome back. Gray Riley from Harrisburg, North Carolina. Michael Corcoran, I believe I said that right. I always butcher these names, so I'm sorry in advance. Daniel Rogers from Rensselaer, New York. Uh, Natty Tongsiri from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Thank you, Natty. Uh, Pearl Del Puerto, we message each other, I believe, on Instagram. Thank you for your generous donation. Glendale, Arizona. Barb and Dan Miller, Zach Miller's parents. Oh, guys didn't have badass. to do that, but thank you so much that's from so Lancaster, cool. Pennsylvania. Kenneth uh, Raz, Razamni also didn't say where you're from. God, I know I'm butchering this. And to people who upped your pledge, uh, Ryan Gennard, Francis Carter, John P. O'Connor, Sarah Huntsman, Brian Laws, uh, sorry, Brian Lawless, Brian Heffernan, and <laughs> I'm so butchered. Good job, Billy. Jocelyn <laughs> I Chipster. wouldn't do any better, though. I- <laughs> Can we, so let me propose and, two things for you. Hang on, hang on. Hard. Before you jump in, before you jumped in, I, I want to thank my executive, executive producers, Gary and Tammy Jones, Mark Robaski, Mark Griffith, Wayne Chan, Andrew Pollard, Liz McCutcheon, Spencer Punter, Jin Yang, Sun Chol Choi, and now Natty Tongsiri from Thailand. Wow. Um, yeah, I, thank you guys so much. This is um, from uh, you know from all of you guys who enjoyed the Zach film, which is out now at YouTube.com. Oh, so good. Slash Billy Yang, uh, Zach and I did this program, this live format last week or two weeks ago, and it was a blast. So maybe we'll definitely work this in a lot more guest dependent and involve you guys because I had a blast. And again. I'm really sorry we couldn't get to all your questions, but this was a blast to do. Wait, Sally, the, three yeah. of, the three of us aren't set in stone. It's not going to be. <laughs> I don't you know. Maybe Sally, just start. I already gave you the idea, Sally. Just start your own channel. Swallow right? I mean, I, I could use w- one of the 50 executive producers that Billy has. <laughs> can I get a little help over here? That's the number one reason why I don't have a show. <laughs> I need a team. Anyone? Final thoughts, Jason and Sally. Thank you guys again for your time, oh, by the way. Thank you, Billy, for thank creating you, this Billy. platform. It's been so fun. I love you guys. Yes, Wish thank you for the same room. Thank you for bringing so much value. Again, reach out to them. Well, yeah, no, I'll say it. Reach out to them. Whether they get back here or not, we'll be on <laughs> their terms. But reach out to them. Uh, let them know how much you enjoy them on this program. At Jason Coop, at Sally McRae, or at Yellow Runner on Instagram and um, SallyMcRae.com, TrainRight.com, all that stuff. Thank you guys so much. It's been a blast, and let's kick ass in 2021. Yeah, you guys. yeah.